I'm going to talk to you about, uh, for the next hour or so, about um, gene lists and networks at an introductory level. I know some people here may have um, already some knowledge in, the, in this area. Um, and hopefully, you guys will also learn something new. But there's also a lot of people that are, uh, have not seen certain, certain things. So this will hopefully, we'll get through a lot of the basics. Um, but just uh, uh, I'll, I'll sort of provide some general introduction and motivation for why we want to interpret gene lists. Um, and then I'll talk about where to get information about genes from lots of different online sources. And we've recommended particular ones that we think are, are easiest to use. Uh, and then talking about issues with how to deal with uh, gene lists, large gene lists. Um, if you haven't uh, um, dealt with these, then um, we'll, we'll also provide some, some useful information there. And then in the second part, um, I'll give you an introduction about uh, network analysis software called Cytoscape um, that uh, we are and many other people are involved in developing. And uh, there's a lot of information in Cytoscape. Um, most of the, the analysis information will be presented tomorrow afternoon. Um, although some other some other of, of the various modules will mention it, but we felt we it would be good to give people an introduction to the software on in the, at the beginning of the workshop, so that during the labs you can because it's a complicated piece of software, you, or there's a lot of functionality in it, you can try it out and ask questions starting from the beginning. Um, okay, so typically um, the the problem with interpreting gene lists, and probably one of the reasons why some some of you are here, is You've done uh, a screen or a gene expression experiment, and um, you've ranked it and clustered it, and there's a reasonable amount of, of uh, tools to allow you to do that quite easily. Um, and then you have a thousand genes, and the question is, now what? Right. So one of the big problems with genomics information is that people use it. You can you can query 20,000 genes in the human genome, um, and then you rank it and find the top three most differentially expressed genes. So you you use that three out of 20,000, and then you throw the rest of the information away. So it would be great if you know there's a lot of information that you're measuring there. It would be great if you could use it all. Um, and uh, to use it all, you have to deal with large gene lists, and that that takes uh, um, some knowledge to how to do that. So um, that's sort of the, the typical situation. Um, so typically, what people do is they may, as I as I mentioned, rank or cluster data. So um, we won't really be talking about how to rank gene expression data or how to cluster it. There is this um, statistical analysis course that Francis mentioned. And a lot of people work with biostatisticians and sort of the typical software that um, a gene expression core facility or, or other, other types of facilities hopefully will have um, sort of the, the, that type of thing set up. Um, and we can ask, we're familiar with that, so you can ask us questions about that if you're interested. But we, in this course, we assume that your data is sort of processed um, outside of, you know, part of, part of the, the data collection. Um, so you have, maybe you cluster the, the data in this particular example. Um, people are, uh, this, this example is using, uh, looking at a, a cluster of down-regulated genes and disease and in, a, in heart disease. And um, most people will look at all the different um, text associated with each of these genes. So if people haven't seen this, most people have. Um, each line, each row here represents a, a gene, and the columns represent different, different experiments, gene expression experiments, and the intensity of the of the square represents the, the, the differential expression of the gene, um, blue in this case being down. Um, and uh, so most people will basically manually look through these, these, these te this text and see if they can link this information they see to textbook knowledge that you, everybody, all biologists have in their, in their head that you've worked so long to put in there. Um, and the, uh, you might see particular pathways coming up, like Oh, this is interesting. There's fatty acid degradation, um, a few genes from there. So maybe maybe fatty acid degradation is involved in this particular, um, is downregulated here. But there's a lot of other pathways and processes here. And how do you know that fatty acid degradation is significant? Uh, maybe that's just maybe almost every gene is involved in in your experiment is involved in fatty acid degradation. So um, so that's where um, computational tools come in. They help you manage all of this prior knowledge about cellular processes that we know about. So we have tons of information about uh, pathways and protein interactions, uh, different types of functional relationships between genes. Um, so all the prior knowledge that we have, ideally, you'd be able to automatically integrate or automatically link up to your results. And then uh, using analysis tools, find interesting patterns. And that would make it easier to interpret the, the gene list and the, and the gene expression data or uh, 
So, so that's sort of the goal of this course is to teach you about um, to cover cover a number of areas in this in the you know of these types of analysis tools. Um, so, just as a quick uh, sort of summary of, of of different types of gene lists. So, I think mo many people here are using gene expression data, um, and I, that's the example that I used. Um, but gene lists come from a number of different sources. Um, People might identify genes without quantifying their expression level using proteomics. You may even have protein quantitation using proteomics um, and ranking and clustering using biostatistics is sort of the typical first step for dealing with that information, as I mentioned. Um, you may have uh, a set of genes that came out of an interaction screen. Say you did a yeast 2 hybrid experiment or a chromatin immunoprecipitation experiment. In, for, for chromatin immunoprecipitation, you found a whole set of transcription factor binding sites for a transcription factor of interest, and all the genes that are upstream of those binding sites form a list, and you're interested to see what, you know, if there's any pathways that are targeted by the transcription factor. Um, a lot of people these days are, are doing genetic screens with RNAi, um, so uh, knocking down genes and screening for a phenotype. So um, if I knock down a thousand or a few thousand genes, and I measure, I, I see if um, the cells are able to uh, grow in a particular medium um, or not. Uh, the, the genes that, are, that, that affect that phenotype are, are all on a list and could be involved in a, in a cellular process. And also association studies. Um, a, lot of, a lot of genomics technology is, is um, being used to identify SNPs and copy number variants on a large scale. Uh, and um, people associate hundreds of SNPs or hundreds of mar genetic markers with a particular disease. And if those are connected with genes, then that's a, that's a, a, gene, a, a gene list. Um, so those are all of the sort of topics that the tools that were, the, the types of gene lists, just as an example, uh, the tools that we'll be uh, discussing can, can analyze. Um, there may be a lot of other examples, and we can chat about that during the, the lab. Um, OK, so what do these gene lists mean? So that's an important question. Um, a lot of people sort of assume that the genes that, they're, that are coming out of their screen, especially from gene expression, would be uh, relating to biological processes. So we, we, we think that biological processes are being regulated somehow, and we have a readout of that. Um, so that's, that's something we'll, we'll focus on. Um, but it could also be, uh, you might also find genes in your list that are just linked by, because they have the same function. Maybe you found all the many genes in your list are protein kinases, and so that's just a, uh, not really related to one particular process. Um, a similar cell or tissue location, or as I mentioned for genetic interact, genetic uh, association studies, chromosomal location. Maybe there's just a whole linkage group that's um, you know you're you're trying to study and see how it's related to other genes in your in your system. Um, so um, you have to obviously think about that. What the what what types of genes are you would expect to come out of your screen, and ideally you have some particular question that you're interested in answering. Um, you already know in advance whether you want to summarize biological processes or other aspects of gene function. You, you know that you want to maybe find a controller for a process. Maybe you're interested in finding transcription factors. Um, if you are, and that might be useful for a follow-up experiment where you modify, you, you, you perturb the transcription factor and see the response in a cell line or something. Um, uh, that might not be reasonable for patient tissue samples to do that kind of thing. Um, uh, when it, your, your goal might be to find new pathways or new pathway members um, or to discover new gene function. Maybe there's a particular gene that you're interested in and you're interested to know more about what it does in, in the system that you're studying. Um, or uh, correlation to a disease or phenotype. Um, and then finally, sort of the, the what a couple of people mentioned, um, you, you might only be interested in differential analysis. So what's different between two samples? I have a cancer sample that's, um, that doesn't metastasize and one that does metastasize. Uh, what pathways are different between, between these? So these are all different types of questions that you have to be, that has to be in your mind when you're, when you're doing this analysis. It's important to define that. But the tools that we'll go over can answer all of these questions in, in different ways. So. Um, uh, we'll talk about gene set analysis, helps summarize uh, information in, in large gene lists. So it's more of a descriptive um, summary of, of, of what's in the data, which you can then help uh, interpret. Gene regulatory network analysis that Wyeth is going to talk about might, will, will help you find controllers like transcription factors that might be controlling processes. Um, 
and uh, pathway network analysis might help you find uh, new pathways, um, and gene function prediction we'll, we'll, we'll discuss as well. But first, we just wanted to, um, does it sound good? <laughs> okay, is that what you uh, are interested in? Okay, but first, we wanted to, I just wanted to go over some gene list basics um, and talk about different types of attributes that uh, ideally you would you'd want to get about genes. Uh, and um, this is sort of a starting point often for, for most people. Um, any questions before we go on? Okay, so um, as many of you are aware, um, given a gene, anybody, any biologist can find tons of information about it. Um, so different types of known functions, position in the chromosome, whether it's associated with the disease or not, um, properties of uh, uh, DNA like the gene structure, any, any SNPs, um, you know, a whole range of other properties, protein domains, post-translational modification sites, uh, interactions with other genes or proteins, the list goes on. And um, the, we're not really going to cover what all of these mean in biology. Mostly, I just wanted to go over some of the bioinformatics uh, methods that um, people use to collect this information and practical places to get this information easily. So uh, there's a lot of information out there, basically, and there's some sites and tools out there that allow you to to get access to it very uh, quite readily, and we'll just cover cover those. So um, the first thing I wanted to go over is um, gene ontology. Um, so how many people here have, are familiar with the gene ontology? How many how many people use it on a regular basis and really really know about it a lot? Okay. So um, so I'm going to go into the the gene ontology is a um, for those people who don't know is uh, a set of uh, it's like a, a, a biological dictionary of, uh, for gene function. So it's a set of controlled vocabulary, which just means it's, an, it's a, uh, a set of terms that people have agreed upon uh, in a standard way to represent gene function. So there are terms like protein kinase or apoptosis or membrane. Um, and the word ontology, if you're not familiar with it, basically just means a formal system for describing knowledge. Um, interestingly, all these terms have definitions associated with them, so it's, it's also a dictionary. And if you're interested to know what anachoesis is or something like that, you can go and look at the, the definition um, in gene ontology, and it's usually pretty good. Um, so uh, the terms are related. They're not just, it's not, so it's like a dictionary in that it has definitions associated with each term, but it's unlike a dictionary in that the terms are related to each other. Uh, so there's um, relationships like, um, uh, apoptosis is a type of is a type of programmed cell death, which is cell death, which is death, which is a physiological process. Um, or B cell apoptosis is part of B cell homeostasis. So there's these relationships like is a and part of, and there's a couple of other relationships in, in gene ontology um, that relate terms to each other. And in general, um, this re this relationship is set up so that more general terms are at the top of the of the hierarchy and and more uh, specific terms are at the bottom. And so this is um, a way of just organizing all of these terms so that you can um, understand how detailed the term is or how uh, yeah, general the term is. Yeah, feel free to ask questions. Uh, how did you uh, uh, deal with, like, for example, anti apoptotic or like, things that are they're related to the same thing but they're doing the opposite? They would have a term called anti-apoptosis process, but they wouldn't have a particular. Yes. It w you would have a separate term for anti-apoptosis. There's no there's no relationship in gene ontology that says antonym, um, like a like the you know the reverse of a you know the opposite thing. So it would just be a separate term, and it would be related to um, you know maybe negative regulation of of you, you have terms like negative regulation of apoptosis. Uh, things like that. So they're sort of um, they they deal with it by adding adding additional terms. It would be a child. But it, would be a parallel. it would probably be a parallel in some related physiological process, like control of of cell death or something like that. Would be maybe a parent term. You have to look to see what it actually is. Um, importantly, terms can have more than one parent or child. So it's not a hierarchy. It's not a real tree. Um, that's important to understand because it actually causes issues. It's not as simple as as you maybe like it to be. Um, so this is sort of an example of um, oops, this sort of migrated cell migrated over here. It's supposed to be here, um, and um, uh, so you have cell as a general term, 
uh, membrane is part of this uh, cell and chloroplast is, could be part of a cell. Um, chloroplast membrane is, uh, is a type of membrane and is part of the chloroplast. Mitochondrial membrane is a, is a type of membrane. Um, and so you sort of get the idea how you go from general to more specific. Um, this is a good example because it includes sort of something that, you, that people recognize as, as part of plants, chloroplasts. Um, while Go itself is species independent, it does have some specific terms that are specific to a group of species, group of organisms. The higher level terms are generally not. So they don't try to be species specific in their gene ontology. It's meant to be general. Um, and, and gene ontology covers three main aspects. Cellular component, parts of the cell, molecular function, like enzymatic activity, and biological process, which typically pathways. And that's fairly important to understand the distinction between those. Um, so the terms are, um, there's thousands of terms. Actually, right now, there's, there's 27,000 terms as of a couple of days ago. Mostly, most of them have definitions. Um, many pathway terms, thousands of cellular components and, and molecular functions. Uh, these terms over the, have been added by uh, people at the European Bioinformatics Institute, um, curators or editors, uh, and by database groups. Um, over over quite a number of years, and they're adding more every you know every year. There's a couple, a thousand or two, uh, two thousand more terms added to gene ontology. Um, you can also add terms yourself if there are no terms for your chemokine pathway that you're interested in. Um, you could suggest that to gene ontology. Um, and experts in in biological experts in specific fields are help with major redevelopment of certain branches of gene ontology. So this is an ongoing effort by lots of different people, a collaborative collaboration, international collaboration, um, and the practical, um, the practical consequence of that is that gene ontology changes and it's updated all the time. So if you do your analysis uh, from, you analyze your data set from two years ago with the current gene ontology, you may find some new things. Um, so gene ontology, uh, the project itself is mostly focused on defining this dictionary and hierarchy. And then people use that to annotate genes. So gene ontology is two parts. It's the terms and the annotations. So the annotations are linking the terms to the genes. And each, um, each uh, annotation is, um, you can have multiple annotations per gene. So a given gene may have 50 different terms associated with it, um, because genes can have multiple functions. So that makes sense. Um, and um, these annotations are. Uh, often created by trained curators, mean, meaning that they're manually assigned, but also there are some annotations that are created automatically, and it's very important to understand the distinction between that from, uh, practically. So um, because there's so many annotations that you might get from gene ontology, um, some of them are, are different, have different quality levels, and you may not be interested in including some of them in your analysis. So uh, the ones that most people are uh, ideally interested in is the ones is the annotations that are manually that that are you know manual annotations by scientific trained scientific curators have basically said okay this is p53 it's involved in you know whatever process um, processes so um, these are typically higher quality annotations but they're smaller in number um, because it's time consuming to manually go read the literature and add add these terms to each gene. Um, across many organisms. And so it's supplemented with electronic annotation. And some of this annotation is um, derived without human validation. So some of the electronic annotation is actually uh, reviewed by, by people, um, and some of it is not reviewed by people. It's just put into the, into the annotations. Um, and uh, some computational predictions are actually quite accurate. You don't really need to review them, like prediction of transmembrane domains or signal peptides is actually 98% accurate in, for, for, many, for many systems. Um, but a lot of others uh, that are just, um, just uh, predicted based on sequence similarity, for instance, are not as accurate in all cases. Um, and it's generally uh, assumed that it's lower quality than the manual, the manual annotation. So key point, be aware of this annotation origin. The way to be aware of that is to look at the evidence type each annotation, if you look at each gene ontology annotation, it's associated with the evidence that was used to assign that term to the gene. And um, there's a lot of different terms here. All of these guys you can sort of read through in this list, uh, the, the different terms. For instance, traceable author statement from a paper. 
Um, that's a particular type of evidence, and it would be associated with the PubMed ID, so you can actually go back to the paper and see what, what the statement was. Um, some of it is inferred from sequence or structural similarity. The important thing is here is that it's actually all of these things, even if they're, they're um, uh, computationally derived, all of these are manually reviewed. Um, and then the one that's not manually reviewed is IEA, inferred from electronic annotation. So sometimes and increasingly actually people are recommending that you, you try your analysis and don't include, you may do both. You may include electronic annotation and not include electronic annotation. Look at the results. Um, because a lot of this electronic annotation is not correct. Um, it just it may be reviewed in the future and, um, and cleaned up. Um, and the reason these codes are here is so that you can, you can filter it, filter the information. Um, the other major concern for people is species coverage. So gene ontology is itself, all the terms are species independent, but the annotations are specific for every organism. So you can download the human annotation or the uh, uh, bacteria, a particular um, you know, E. coli annotation um, or mouse annotation. Um, all major eukaryotic model organisms are, are covered reasonably well. Um, human is um, covered by Gene Ontology Annotation Group, the main group, uh, the Uniprobe database. Um, there's a number of bacterial and parasite species, um, and new species are constantly being added. If you go to geneontology.org, um, and I actually wanted to bring that up in a, can bring it up later in a, uh, bring up the website in the lab um, to show you uh, the list of of, gene, of of organisms. But the important thing to notice to note is that there's variable coverage between organisms. So this is a little bit um, older plot, but it, you get, it's, it's still the same today in terms of the general idea. Um, this represents the coverage of genes with annotation, either um, electronic or non-electronic annotation. So you can see that certain model organisms that have been studied using genomic techniques for a long time, like, like budding yeast, have 100% coverage. Every gene in yeast has been man manually looked at and assigned a term. Some of the terms say unknown function. Um, unknown function is not really a, a term anymore, but something similar, like just a very general function like biological process. Um, but they've manually at least checked that nobody knows about that, and they're keeping, up, keeping it up to date. So um, the, um, that, that sort of, you know, this, this as Svi as mentioned, is uh, um, sort of hides the fact that, that some, of the, some of the terms that are associated with genes are fairly general and may not really tell you much about the function of the gene. Like, oh, it's involved in the biological process. Well, surprise, surprise. Um, so the, um, uh, but, but this, it, it does, uh, certain species are, are better than others. So um, for instance, I do some work with C. elegans sometimes, and I'm surprised at the low level of coverage of C. elegans in gene ontology. It makes it more difficult to, to use, whether, whereas human and mouse and, uh, and yeast and certain other well-studied species are much better um, annotated. And this, um, for, for some of the tools that we'll talk about later, um, they depend on having gene ontology annotations. And if the gene ontology annotations aren't that great for the species that you're studying, you have to um, either work to um, improve that in the community, uh, or um, you, that you're, you could understand that it's worth a try to try, the, try these tools out, but it may not work as well as the human case, for instance. There's a number of databases that contribute to this, and you can look at this also on the Genotology website. Um, a couple of other useful tips for Genotology. Um, there's so many thousands of terms that some people have difficulty using Genotology, especially for high-level summaries. Like often you might want to have a pie chart that just in your paper that says, um, I have a thousand genes, and I just want to give a, get a, give a sense of where they're located in the cell. Um, so for this, for these types of applications, there's something called GoSlim, which is a uh, little slim version of uh, a, a, it's a reduced set of Go terms that's official and made available on the Gene Ontology site. And there's a few different ones. There's a generic one. There's a plant one. There's a yeast one. And um, uh, you can you can use these sometimes for sort of high level views. Um, and there's also uh, dozens of free software tools. All of the resources in gene ontology, all of the terms and, and annotations are freely available. Anybody can use it without restrictions. Um, and there's also um, a number of tools that are available, and you can go to the site. And we'll cover some of them today. Um, a good place to access gene ontology, one of my favorite places at least because it's relatively fast, is QuickGo. 
at the at the European Bioinformatics Institute, um, and you can search for Go terms and get uh, a lot of information, including charts of the relationships of the terms to uh, other terms. Um, if you click through here, you can get statistics about how often terms are used in different organisms. There's a there's a large amount of information. This, I, there's a lot of sites out here that do this, like you may have heard of Amago and other ones. All of them are use the same information in the background, but I this quick go I think is easy to use and relatively fast. Um, and there's also a lot, of, a lot of other ontologies. So the success of gene ontology has spurred lots of other people to create similar dictionaries for cell type or anatomical part uh, or other things like that. Um, and there's a, a, lo a list of quite a few, you know, probably almost 100 of them um, that, are, that are available. So those might be useful for other, other types of projects that you have. OK. so. Spent a fair amount of time on gene ontology, mainly because it's used by so many people uh, and some, so many of the tools that we'll be using as a, a, an excellent source of gene function annotation that is computer readable, um, easily, freely accessible, and a lot of people are contributing to it. Um, all of these other types of gene attributes um, that uh, are available for genes uh, and proteins, I'm not going to spend as much time on. Um, but um, mostly these can all be <coughs> retrieved from just a few sources. Um, we're we're going to talk about one, um, Ensemble Biomart, um, and um, mostly for eukaryotes, although now it's starting to branch out into plants, viruses, bacteria. So every organism will be covered at some level with, with, with this tool. Um, Entree Gene, most people have, have, uh, are aware of it, um, is the uh, sort of best general resource on genes that, that, that exists. And if you study a particular organism, often there's a, a community that's built up around that organism that's created a database called a model organism database that, um, like, like the one for yeast, yeastgenome.org or um, mouse, uh, that most people who are working in that field would be familiar with. And those are all excellent sources of all of this information, sort of a single point of single, you know, one-stop shop for, for this information. There's lots of others. Um, if these resources, when we go through them, don't cover your particular organism or uh, you know, study that you're doing, we can discuss to try and find others. Um, so we'll, we'll go through this um, in, the, in the lab. Um, uh, how many people have used uh, Ensemble Biomart? One or two. How many people have used Ensemble, the website, as a genome browser? Uh, so a few. OK. so that's. Um, that's great. So um, Ensemble Biomart is convenient access to information about gene lists. You can submit your gene list and get information about gene ontology, information about sequences, SNPs, structures, homologs, um, other types of, all the different types of identifiers that may, may be associated with a gene, uh, chromo chromosomal locations, you, you, know, you name it. it ha most information that's associated with the genome is available. Um, and um, it's when you when you initially go look at the website, I found that it's not as intuitive for first-time users. Um, you, but it's actually very easy to use. You just have to get over this little initial hump of, of understanding how it works, and then it's 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 very easy to use after that to go to just shopping for information. So um, the first step is selecting a, a genome. So most people would select ensemble genes, um, and then you'd select once you select ensemble genes, you select your, um, your species uh, of interest. Um, and then you can define filters. Um, there's sort of a little button that says filters. And filters basically allow you to filter down from the entire genome to some subset that you're interested in. And there's different ways of doing that. So you can say, I only want genes in chrom the, on chromosome 1. Or I only want genes, um, oops. So there's sort of a way to, to, to filter by a region. Um, or I only want genes that have specific gene ontology terms. Or I only want genes that have these different types of identifiers. Um, I have a list of gene names, for instance, and I only want information about those gene names. Um, or genes that have membrane domains or specific domains or lots of different things. So that's once you define your filters, you can, um, you can uh, then select attributes to download. And that's then sort of step two is, um, that's where you, you say, OK, this is the information I want about the gene list. We'll cover that a little bit more later, but that's sort of the, the general idea. 
Um, okay, so just as a, as a summary, um, basically we mentioned that there are tons, lots of different gene attributes available in databases. Gene ontology is a great place for most information about gene function. It's not the only place, but it's probably the most convenient, and, and for definitely for some organisms, it's the most comprehensive. Um, uh, and uh, we talked about how, how that's a, a classification system, and there's terms and annotations, and how Go can be simplified and used. Um, we'll go over a lot, of, a lot more uses of, of this information later. And then many other gene attributes are available from Ensemble Biomart. Any questions about about that? You talked about uh, the species which should be covered or which can be covered. How about, um, or let's say I have a species which I did a high throughput sequencing, for example, which is not a non which is a non model species. Um, is there any way to electronically infer uh, annotations? Or what we also try is we blasted it on a model organism genome and then look for their go annotations. And what's the worst of this? What's the sense or is there any value of this kind of analysis? Yeah, so if you have, and this is increasingly the case, you have a new genome sequence because it's getting easier and easier to, to, to get new genome sequences. Um, before you, you know, the first step is exactly what you do. Compare, uh, do a sequence similarity search with every other protein, known protein and known gene, and transfer the annotation if it's over a certain uh, sequence similarity. Most genome centers, genome sequencing centers, kind of have automatic pipelines for this these days, but I'm not sure how it's working now if you're just doing it yourself. Um, I'm not sure how, how that sort of fits in with the genome annotation pipeline. But typically, what would happen, um, you know, if, if the Sanger and Center or Tiger sequence the genome, they, they do exactly what you said. They just blast, um, use existing software to, to, um, to do that. Also, um, they'd map protein interaction networks and functional association networks from other species via those homology links to this new genome and try and use that uh, for network-based function prediction. We'll talk about that tomorrow afternoon, how network-based function prediction works. Um, but always it's going to be by uh, the, the, g the gene um, function transfer is always going to be by sequence similarity um, in some way. Um, so if that's all you have, then you, 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 you have to use it. And th that's reasonably accurate for, for, um, for many cases. It's just that there are some cases where it's definitely going to fail. So certain enzymes, for instance, have almost the same sequence, but there's a few residues in the, in the active site that are different. And you know, so that you're, it's going to be a different, different substrate binding, right? Um, and that's very difficult for, for these things to, to analyze. So it's, more, it's good for more of a general sense of, of the function, not specific enzyme functions or other things like that. You may know it's a kinase, but you don't know what kind of kinase it is. You can, um, quick, quick Go is mostly for looking up information about Go terms. Sorry, um, and you can get information about annotation, but I I think it's most useful for for Go terms. Um, and then Biomart I think is better for for gene annotation. Um, sorry, should I did, did that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you do this blasting, you usually get um, a mixed list, right? So you get uh, from let's say I I sequenced insects, then I get uh, all kinds of hits from the doctor, but also from bombings from other species. Mm -hmm. Is that fine to have a mixed list and yeah. use that for the Go annotations, or should it be on one genome? No, it can be a mixed list. So typically, people use all available information. So they'll they'll just blast the proteins, translated proteins against all known proteins, and maybe there's two million known proteins or something. Quaid? Sorry, on the mixed list, you want to make sure you only have one annotation per gene, though. Yeah. Right. So you want to filter. So if you got blast to multiple, you got you know you got blast to multiple organisms. Well, you're biased with your results if you have more than one annotation per gene. So like one annotation. You choose, you gotta choose one of the genes. Right. Which is usually the highest of the level. So, so that, that we, can, we can chat about that more. Yep? Um, what is the output of the Go term comparison on slide next testing Go quick go? Oh, I'm, I, I actually, we can, we can check that out. I haven't used, this is a newer feature that I don't use so often, so we can, we can look at that during the lab.
Um, okay, so uh, any other questions about annotation? Okay, so the other um, sort of main, so that sort of covers getting information about your gene list, which is pretty basic first step. Um, another quite basic first step is um, how to deal with all of the different names for the gene and different identifiers. Um, I'm sure many people, anybody who's worked with a gene list, has gotten stuck on this problem. Um, you have, you know, your affymetrics IDs, and you want to get the the, the gene symbols for that and then convert it to entre gene IDs and that because this other tool only recognizes entre gene IDs or something like that. This is a huge headache for everybody and um, uh, people are working to solve it. Um, there's a, you, you do have to kind of deal with this and it's a little bit of a pain but usually it only takes, you only have to deal with it once for, for, um, for each experiment. Um, if you do deal with it and you get uh, identification from say David if you use Mm -hmm. Some other software, and if there's a difference between what is there in the anti matrix and it, which one is the more reliable one? Which is the one you use? So I'll, I'll mention that, but there's it's um, that's that's a hard point, and it's not it's not uh, so in that particular for each each question like that, like is David or Affymetrix more reliable? It's a different answer, right? So for in that particular case, I would trust Affymetrix because they're the they're the the source. Um, and David probably just downloads from from Affymetrics, and maybe it's it's maybe it's um, it's not um, it's conflicting because David's a little bit out of date. Maybe they haven't downloaded the latest file or something like that. Could be no, many reasons for that. Um, you have to kind of do some investigation work to figure out why. But it's always good to get from the source if possible. So if you know what the source is, then that's 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 good. If David, if if a resource like David. Um, if you know by reading their paper or talking to them that they do more than Affymetrics, they just don't use the Affymetrics data and, and copy it. They also supplement it with additional things and correct errors and other things like that. If they do a lot extra work, maybe it's value-added information. I don't think David does in that particular case, but there are resources that try and fix problems, and, and mostly for Affymetrics, just Affymetrics. Um, Would you be going through that in the... Uh, we won't be going through that any particular case. Um, but I'll just talk about some general tools that will help you for many cases. Um, so, um, as many people know, identifiers are sort of they're they're uh, they're used to track things. Um, so, something ideally, if you want to track it, like a, a protein or a gene in a database, ideally that is the the the, the thing you use to track is some unique and stable name for it, right? So, we all have um, fairly um, you know, we're, uh, you know, social insurance numbers, for instance, are, are unique and stable. Um, uh, entree gene IDs for genes are fairly, are, are definitely unique and fairly stable. I don't think they, there's almost, they almost never change. Um, but uh, a lot of identifiers for genes um, are not always unique and stable. Um, and because gene and protein information is stored in many databases, every database assigns their own tracking number. And that causes a lot of confusion if you have tracking different tracking numbers from different databases. Um, so, G basically, the, you know, the, the problem is that genes have many ident many identifiers. So there's also there's different records for genes, DNA, RNA, protein structure, um, and it's important to recognize that not all the databases that talk about a gene are talking about the same thing. Some like Entree Gene is talking about genes. They don't have information about the protein sequence as part of Entree Gene. If you download Entree Gene, it doesn't tell you what the protein sequence is. Instead, there's a link from Entree Gene to the protein sequence database, which has its own identifier. And the relationship of that is that a gene can give rise to multiple proteins if you have alternative splicing. So it's not necessary that you'll just have one gene, one protein. So you have to understand not only the, the different types of identifiers, but the relationships and the type of, of data that you're, you're dealing with. Um, so um, those are, you know, just just something to be aware of. Most of you probably know that. Um, this is an example of all of the links between databases at the, the NCBI, the people who maintain Entree Gene, part of the National Library of Medicine, and you can see how complicated it is. All these different circles or databases, and the links, um, you know, the lines between them are are pointers from one database to another, and each one uses its own tracking number. Um, and 
there's a here's some examples of different tracking different ID, IDs that people use. So for gene, um, you have ensemble, entree gene, RNA, protein, and species specific, various different ones. Many people will recognize these. There's even uh, tracking numbers for annotations like SNPs or disease associations or domains, um, or experimental. Some are specific to experimental platforms. Um, just for your reference in, in your notes, um, we've just highlighted and underlined ones that are that that we personally recommend. These are ones that are most likely to be stable and unique um, and, and not to change that much over time. Whereas some of these other ones, like even Hugo, you know, human gene names change from year to year. It's very annoying because um, you know, you'll have problems like what Rama mentioned. Um, okay, so so for specific cases, for if you have well, well in during the lab is basically that's an opportunity for you to try and use the software that that we'll recommend, and also the software that you're used to using. There's lots of different places to get this, to, to, to handle this information. And if you have issues, like specific issues, we can try and answer them, um, all the, the, the instructors. Um, so ideally, what you want to do with the, these IDs, typically, is map them from one type to another. That's the practical thing that you want to do when you have gene expression data, and you want to map it to gene function annotation. So. Um, I mentioned that conversion conversion is a headache. There's basically four main things that you want to do with this information. One is um, you want to search for a favorite gene name. Um, so ideally, you would have access to all the known gene names so that your search is more likely to, to get an answer. Um, if you don't have all the gene name synonyms, then when you search for your favorite gene name, it might not, even though your gene is in the system, it may not hit it. Um, so that's important, um, an important type of use. Um, uh, you want to link out to related resources. So this is sort of getting information about the gene list. So if I have a set of genes, I want to link to related resources. I want to get sequence information and domain information, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and um, also identifier translation. So this typically happens most when you have a, a gene expression or a genomics experiment. And there's particular tracking numbers for all the different measurements on the, on the platform that you're using, like for gene expression, you'd have Affymetrix or Illumina, um, or for SNPs, you'd have different different ones. Um, and so you want to translate those to recognizable gene symbols that are that you can then use to better you know, figure out what's actually going on in your, in your data. And the other thing that we'll, we'll discuss is, is unification. So you want to merge data sets um, from different databases that have different IDs, and you want to make sure that you find the equivalent the equivalent records and put them and, and say that they're equivalent and um, sort of all related but slightly different uses. Um, the important thing, I guess, and I'm going to uh, mention it later uh, as well, is that um, uh, the important thing to kind of understand about this um, are these. These are uh, it's sort of. Even though there's subtle differences between these uses, it's important to understand them because there's different ways of making mistakes in, in them, and I'll talk about the challenges next. Um, there's a lot of different services out there now that help you map map these IDs. There's um, David, as was mentioned. Uh, there's 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 actually a few dozen of them, um, and uh, the one I like recently is called Synergizer, and I like it because it's just so easy to use, and it's just focused on one thing: identifier translation. Um, but you can also do identifier translation with Biomart and at Uniprot, um, basically with, with um, and, and many other sources, as I mentioned. Synerg Synergizer basically takes all the information from Ensemble, and you can put in a set of genes uh, in Synergizer and say, okay, these are Affymetrix IDs, and I want entree gene IDs, or I want gene symbols. Um, and you, get, you basically get a, a table that results in this. That's all it does. It's fairly Sorry. simple. It should be able to convert gene name, a list of gene symbols or names. So that's a, that's one of the challenges I'll mention. Um, do you mean when you mean gene names? Do you mean synonyms like protein names? Yes. It's right. So can it handle? It can handle standard gene names. But usually, if there's synonyms that are not standardized, it's, these tools are not, not, are not that good at recognizing them. Um, and I'll mention that in a sec. Uh, so for, some time, for certain cases, that works really well. In other cases, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so here are the, the challenges. Um, 
So um, basically, this is one of the probably major sources of errors in genomics analysis. Uh, because if you don't do a good job mapping IDs, you, you map the wrong ID, then you'll have you'll think that your gene, um, MDM2, is expressed in this way, but it's actually not MDM2 that you're talking about. It's something else. Um, and that would be pretty, you know, that's a pretty important, pretty serious mistake. So it is important to, to you know, check these, these lists over. Um, there's a couple of different problems that may occur. So one, one thing is gene names. So um, there's lots of different types of gene names. And in general, a lot of gene names are ambiguous, which means that they're not necessarily unique for every gene. You can have two different genes with the same name. And that makes it very difficult for computer programs to, to sort out, because a computer's software is not smart, and it can't figure out which is the right one that you mean. Um, so it, it just has a big list, and it looks up in the list. So um, in general, gene names, synonyms are not a good, not a good identifier. So an example of this is if for the gene p People typically, for instance, for p53, people say p53. But and there's a whole bunch of different um, names. If you go to Entree Gene, Entree Gene is actually the best source, I think, of um, of, of gene name synonyms. Um, you can see these four different names for p53. But the standard gene symbol is actually called TP53. Um, so it's best to use the standard gene symbols if, if possible for tracking your data. Um, and, and it's also the, the, the sort of standard gene symbol is recognized by, by these tools. And the standard, the standard gene symbols, sorry, are um, organized differently by different, in different organisms. On which tools do you find the standard gene All of the gene databases usually have the standard gene symbol as the, they call it the symbol. Um, so often it's, they use the word symbol. So if you go to Entree Gene, it will say the standard symbol or standard name. If you go to a, a yeast database, it will say this is the standard name, and then there's aliases or synonyms. Is it a particular fit on the Usually. Um, and not every database may make that distinction, but it's an important distinction, and the ones that we discuss do make that distinction. Um, for, for every organism, it's different. Basically, it's just up to the people who are working with that organism to standardize the gene names. For, so for human, it's the Human Gene Naming Consortium. For mouse, it's the mouse database for yeast, it's the yeast database who standardizes these names. Yes. Yeah. So um, the the um, if if a gene name if you put in a something in the in the list and it's not recognized, it will tell you. Um, and you can go and see maybe manually uh, manually look at that to, to correct it. So have you noticed that there is a progressive uh, lessening of recognition of these identifiers as you go from, you know, say for example, Atometrics uh, uh, code to the uh, the entree gene and then to gene symbol. You mean it's progressively lesser? I mean, you mean as you, as you do tr the translation, you lose yeah. genes? Yeah. Yeah. So that's this that's this last problem. So there's problems reaching, um, thank <laughs> yeah. good. problems reaching 100% coverage. So. Um, these are due to the to the things that you, that you you are aware of probably. Um, there may be version issues like Synergizer may is is get, getting information from Ensemble, which gets information from Mathematrix for Mathematrix <laughs> data, that gets information from Illumina for Illumina data, um, etc. Um, some people have have problems with different companies' annotations. So when when a company, for instance, for gene expression, provides you with a chip, they have these annotation files, and in the past. People didn't like the Affymetrics files, but they've gotten a lot better. Um, and for certain organisms, they still might not be might not be ideal. And within the community, people sort of figure that out and say, "Well, it's not as good. Maybe we can do better." And they update it, um, maybe manually even. Uh, for other platforms like Illumina, sometimes for certain platforms, people say, "I'm not. I don't really trust this Illumina annotation as much as you know getting it from this other source." So if there's problems with the annotation, people usually try and fix it, and then it's a problem that you have to deal with somehow, and it's going to take more time. Um, but generally, a lot of um, the, the, the well-studied systems um, and the, the platforms that are fairly established have very good annotation. Um, but one of the, one of the, re the reasons that you would not get annotation, uh, any coverage um, just off the bat, and you wouldn't even expect this, is if you have a probe ID on a gene expression array, and you don't even know what gene it is, right? 
Um, they, they, maybe it's not even a gene anymore. Maybe it was designed when they thought that an open reading frame existed and now they don't think it's a gene. Uh, or there's hundreds of different, or many, you know, many different reasons why that might happen. Um, also, um, there may not be any known information about that gene, or there may not be a gene symbol known. So you, you will lose a whole bunch of probe uh, of information through a lot of reasons like that. Um, and then there's another type of, uh, um, and those are unavoidable. You just can't do anything without, without doing more experiments. But, the, um, but once you have a set of, a set of uh, gene IDs that are, uh, are avoidable, um, you know, things that you can do to increase the coverage where, where it is possible. So sometimes it's, it's a problem with different databases. So Entree Gene is pretty um, comprehensive. But maybe it doesn't have an, 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 an entree gene uh, ID or number for all of the genes. And maybe instead there's a Swiss pro or Uniprot number for some of those genes that don't have entree gene IDs. So it's, it's usually good to kind of try to map to a few different sources. And what I usually do is I put them all in Excel and I see um, if there's a, a category of genes that are missing entree gene IDs, but they have Uniprot IDs, then I'll kind of copy the Uniprot IDs and see if I can get entree gene IDs. Usually um, by doing that, by doing this initial thing with the easy thing with Synergizer, you'll you'll get 90% coverage reasonably well. And then if you want to um, do this additional work in Excel, you can improve your coverage by actually examining the the results. Just to comment on a couple of things, these favorite tools change from year to year, mostly because the people who are create the tools lose interest. The graduate who does them moves on. So they don't keep updating the underlying files. So you will find new things as, as you get the sense of your synergizer is the flavor of the month. Um, I put a few other links on the wiki. So for those of you who try to find some other ones, there's one in Spain that has some nice features. And I put a link to David for the explanation. So as we go along, we'll try to post some links on the wiki. Thanks. Yeah, and, and, and by all means, this, the tools that we present in general are not the only tools. They're just one that we're, we're presenting. And this, the tools that I present per, are just the ones that I use personally. Uh, yeah, but it, uh, like you said, you know, I did try this. And you, you do this, but you always worry about it. So the point I'm trying to make is that would you then, at one point, go back to the source? Like, for example, if you're using the data metrics platform, right? Would you go to the company and say, OK, or not the company, and you would go to the website and get the actual sequence? And try to blast that sequence and see if it comes up with something different from what your, even your unit plot or your other, you know, identifiers have come. So that's a that's a uh, would be great if if probably if you did that. I'm not sure how many errors you'd find. This is mostly a question of trust um, and reputation of the annotation file. So whether you choose to do that or not, sometimes it's sometimes you can't even get the sequences because they won't give it to you. So that's a problem. Um, but um, and then you know. Who knows what you what you do then? Use another platform, but um, <laughs> the uh, but but that would be an ideal thing to do. It's just time consuming. Um, if you want to go to that level of detail, you could go through and check every every gene name, and it will reduce. Definitely, you will find errors, and it will you will reduce the number of errors. It's just the amount of time that you're willing to spend um, to do that. Focus in on those that you didn't get, or that you know, oh. Yeah, if for the ones that you didn't get, um, you can definitely do that and. Uh, it's, it's possible to do that. Um, another thing that you guys should be aware of is uh, errors that are, are introduced by Excel. So um, how many people have seen errors introduced by Excel? So quite a few. So um, we have to write a group letter to Bill Gates um, <laughs> to complain. But basically, um, Excel has auto formatting features that it's, it's very, it uh, tries to be really smart. Um, but you know that's not the kind of intelligence that we, you know, it's good in biology. It's maybe good in business. When you type in the gene OCT4, it changes it to October 4th, because OCT4 is obviously a date, um, not a gene. So um, when you're using Excel, you can turn off these features, but they're on by default. So um, the, the the major, the insidious sort of the, the the nasty part of this is that when you're pay, copying and pasting gene lists of a thousand or two twenty thousand genes. You will not notice that this is happening because it, it's just out. Of, it's not. You don't even see it on the screen. So um, definitely be aware of that and ch and turn off these autocorrect features if you're using Excel. Or if you don't like that, you can try and um, 
uh, compare the results after you've pasted in Excel um, again in a in a text editor or something, and just just compare them. Uh, that's probably too much too too much effort. If you if you know how to do uh, Excel ma uh, macros and um, functions, you can you can automate some of this double checking. But ideally, you just turn off these features. And there's a paper about that um, by Zeberg et al. from uh, 2004, just about all these different errors that are introduced. And it's in the book. Yes, you guys have it. Sorry? Open Office. Um, I haven't really used Open Office that much. Um, I think it also has these autocorrect features, but I'm not sure if they're on by default or what the particular way that they work on. It may be better. Um, but most people are using Excel anyway because, you know, everybody's, you know, it, you don't want to not use a very powerful tool just because it's, it's, um, it has this error. Just something to be aware of and you can, you can fix, you can prevent it from happening if you are careful about the formatting of the, of the copy and pasting and you're just aware of it. Um, but this paper actually, when it came out, it was very interesting because they, they analyzed databases and they found that, uh, that this problem was, you know, it, October 4th was listed as a synonym for Octopore and en Entree Gene or something like that. Um, okay, so um, how are we doing for time? Um, what time did we say the break was? 10.50? 10.30, okay. Okay. So, um, So, okay, so this is a summary of the main, main things that we discussed. Um, there's lots of identifiers for genes and their products. Um, we have to, when we're working with large gene lists, you have to understand how to convert this using available ID mapping services and try and use standard commonly used identifiers when possible to avoid some of these challenges um, that exist. Okay, any other questions? So, yeah. I'm just thinking about submitting these data sets for publication. I'm wondering if there's a buzz around in terms of the standard for what would be used or what you refer to uh, in generating the data sets. Or is this a problem that other people are actually encountering? The ones that I that we underlined in the book um, are fairly general and standard. Like for instance, I try to use entree gene IDs wherever possible, but mostly in figures you'd use if you're working with human the standard symbol or something like that. Um, so I try to use a standard symbol, even if it's even if I work with proteins and protein has a different name. Um, I try to use the gene symbol just because it makes it easier for people to look up. Um, but uh, there is no official standard because everybody um, who does research in biology has a license to name their own gene, and they want to it named a particular thing. And two people who are working on the same gene want it named different things, and people argue about this. There's no Eventually, it will have to be um, standardized, but um, the, there and there are standard efforts like the Human Genome Naming Consortium stuff. So, try to use standard efforts where they're available, um, and I think that's safe. Um, okay, so in the next uh, few minutes, um, I just wanted before the break, I just wanted to uh, give you a quick introduction, completely change topics. Um, and tell you about network visualization and analysis, give you an introduction to um, particular type of software, Cytoscape software. Um, again, there are other network analysis and, and visualization software out there. This is probably the most commonly used one, and many people work on it, including our, uh, my own lab and nine other, nine other labs. Um, so the focus of the next section will be on just the basics of, of this software and what it can do, just to give you a flavor of it, so that you can try it out during the lab, the open labs, when you have time. And also this evening, um, if you're planning to stay for the open lab this evening, you can try it out. And during that time, we can answer questions. But the real use of Cytoscape in terms of analyzing will be covered in tomorrow afternoon. And we'll go over that again in more detail in the lab. You can, by all means, try out all, this, all of this, the, the things before that. So Cytoscape, um, and I think many of you have installed it on your laptop already. And how many people before this course, before hearing about it by this course, have used Cytoscape? Okay, so. I used it, but uh, I didn't 
it was not very successful. It needs to work the Okay. Okay. So, um, so Cetascape is uh, a freely available network visualization and analysis software that is uh, you can install on, on most types of computers. Um, it's it's made by a number of different labs, um, people at, in in academia and industry, um, California and New York and Paris, and um, also Agilent Technologies and Unilever are contributing to the software. Um, it's great for visualizing networks. If you have any kind of network information, like protein interactions or gene interactions, you can visualize it and overlay lots of different types of data on it, on the network. And I'll mention that. And it, it also has a lot of additional functionality that comes in from plugins that you can install, um, sort of add-ons. A typical way that you'd analyze um, network, uh, network, you know, do network analysis on gene expression, for instance, is um, uh, collect information about networks, and this comes from a number of different sources. Again, I'll kind of go into more detail on this. Um, I'm giving you a quick intro, but I'll go into more detail about where these sources are and what they, what they are, how to use them tomorrow afternoon. Um, but the idea is that you get network information, um, and you, um, then you, can, you can analyze it, and you can combine that with gene expression data or protein expression data. Cytoscape um, allows you to visualize and, and manipulate networks, so you can um, move parts of the network around with your mouse. Um, you can automatically lay out networks in different ways, and automatic layout basically just helps you see the network. Uh, so that it's not all crowded and all the, the nodes and, and all the, the, the things are, are not over, overlapping each other. Um, you can filter the information. You can, it connects to databases to get information about, about this, uh, about networks. Um, and um, uh, maybe just before I continue, um, Module 4, again, has sort of more general introduction about interaction databases. It also has more general introduction about networks and what they mean. <laughs> And I'll just um, maybe just give the example of protein interaction networks now, which is something that people may be familiar with. So just think about protein interactions for this type of, of thing. And you, well, we'll see other types of networks later. Um, so one of the things that um, people sometimes, if, you, if you're ever dealing with lots of network information, like large amounts of protein interactions, uh, one of the problems is that you get a hairball effect. And if you see papers that you um, may have seen that, that show networks. Often there's this big ball of, uh, it looks like a hairball, and people, it's difficult to interpret. So the way to deal with that is to kind of zoom in on particular areas and focus in on that. So if you are interested in a particular pathway, you can just select the, the nodes from the, the proteins from that pathway and, and look at them and look at their relationships. Um, and Cytoscape allows you to do this. Um, software also allows you to visualize lots of different types of data on the, this, uh, on the network altogether. So this is a protein interaction network from yeast that's centered around genes that are involved in DNA um, rep, yeah, damage and repair. Um, and um, each circle is a protein. Each line that connects the circles is a protein interaction from a, the BioGrid database. And the nodes are colored by uh, Go function kinetic core, nucleosome, replication fork, sort of the particular general type of function. Um, and the size of the nodes are related to the um, transcription amplitude or the activity in a, in a cell cycle experiment. So this is a particular experiment that um, looked at the expression of genes over the cell cycle. And the highest level of expression is the size of the node. And also, um, um, so you can, you can see that the nucleosome is highly expressed at some points of the cell cycle, whereas the kinetic cores genes are not as highly expressed very over the cell cycle. Um, the thickness of the lines is represented to the, ex the correlation of expression between two genes. So if there's very thick lines between two genes, like here, it means these two proteins or genes are highly correlated. They're always expressed at the same time or not expressed at the same time. Um, so just by overlaying all of this type of data onto a network, you can really get a sense of, um, uh, you, you, can, you can start understanding um, some additional information about a network, like um, gene functions are sort of clustered together if you're looking at protein interaction networks. And this, this property can be used to predict new functions. So if there's an unknown gene here that you, is not known to be involved in the kinetic core, but it's connected to a lot of kinetic core genes, and maybe it's 
part of the kinetic core or controlling the kinetic core or somehow involved. Um, uh, the, um, this is you know, also high, highly clustered things like this are protein complexes. Often uh, you can see that. Um, and uh, it sort of gives you just an idea about how the biological processes are connected. So this is sort of the advantage of visualizing it, genomics information on a network is that you can bring in a lot of prior information, put it together in a single picture, and you know most people are vis very visual, so it's it's nice to kind of look at a picture and um, and and start thinking about how that relates to to your experiment. Um, so that this is just an example of particular examples. Is the, color, um, the the color in this case is linked to a, a go term. Yes. I don't have the Go term ID here, but um, these were derived. This information was derived from gene ontology. So, Cytoscape, you can use it to make figures like this, and we'll show you how to do that in the lab, and also tomorrow afternoon, and you can try it yourself. Um, so, I guess the the main well, that's one of the main advantages of Cytoscape is network visualization. The other main advantage is that there's a large active community around the software, um, which has developed a lot of help documentation and tutorials, different case studies. There's a mailing list for discussion and um, different data sets that you can try out. We've included um, a paper, uh, a, a protocol of how to use Cytoscape for gene expression uh, um, uh, analysis in your, in your binder. Um, there's an annual conference if you end up being really interested in this. Um, there's thousands of users, um, quite a lot of downloads of this thing and lots of, um, because there's an active community, people have, have extended the functionality of the software by providing, by writing their own plugins. And so you can go shopping for, for plugins that are, that are useful for particular types of analysis and, um, and that some of those might be particularly useful for you. Um, I will be covering more of that, the plugins tomorrow, but um, I'll cover about five or six of them and um, that, are, that are most re relevant for omics interpreting gene lists. Um, but there's quite a lot of other plugins that are available that you can go and look, look at. If you are a programmer or you're friendly with a programmer and there's a plugin that there's no plugin that does what you need, um, you can write it yourself because the software is open access and, and freely accessible to extend. Um, okay, so uh, that's really just a, a, a taste of what Cytoscape is, just to give you an intro. Um, that it's useful and free software for visualizing, visualizing and, and analyzing networks, um, and it provides the basic, all the basic uh, routines for manipulating networks and their plugins to extend the, the functionality. Um, so uh, again, we'll go over that quite a bit more the next day and a half or two days. Um, but any questions right now about what we've mentioned so far? Um, the latest version is 2.6.3. Um, that's you don't need to necessarily upgrade, but there are new features in 2.6. Some of them we'll be mentioning here, so you may want to upgrade. One of the plugins is not included in the agenda. It's not in the agenda. Oh, um, yeah. So we'll look at why that is. I, it was working for me, so I will have to just check. I know some people have had problems um, including or installing the Agile literature search plugin. Um, I don't know if, if uh, it, so I couldn't verify that, but it, it, um, there's a checkbox that says um, um, show outdated plugins. I don't know if you, if you tried checking that. Um, sometimes a new version of Cytoscape comes out and not all the plugins have been updated to be verified with it, but they're still usable with it. So if you check that box, you'll see additional ones. And um, if that's really not working, then we can do, um, there's a particular file that you can delete and have it re just reset it so that it may that may fix certain problems. So um, so uh, and during the lab we can we can uh, hopefully get everyone set up with Cytoscape. 2.6.3 the, the only difference between that and, and earlier versions of 2.6 is fixes for Macintosh computers that uh, upgraded to the latest version of Java. So they're, it's fairly technical but um, if you have a Mac you probably do want to use the latest version. Um, any other questions? Okay, so um, we have uh, it's 10:30 now, and we have a 20-minute break. Um, 
I guess there's uh, refreshments outside. And after we come back from the break, at 10.50, we'll have uh, a demo of Cytoscape. I'll just show it to you on, on the computer. And we'll also uh, talk about, we'll actually take you through the, the resources that we mentioned, Biomart and, um, and Synergizer. And uh, you can check out the wiki for other links that, that some of the other instructors have posted. And we can chat about that as well.